Thank you. Uh, so uh, uh, in this talk, I'm going to do a first re review uh, a method that uh, by now is something like 24 years old. Uh, uh, yeah. Anyway, from 1987, uh, uh, which uh, originally was called Hybrid Monte Carlo, uh, but uh, which uh, uh, is more descript descriptively named uh, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. And uh, I'll, uh, having described that and what its wonderful advantages are, I'll then uh, uh, talk about two methods that are related in that they use Hamiltonian dynamics in order to uh, uh, do Monte Carlo methods. And uh, that I that I've been working on recently. Uh, they're both uh, uh, sort of prelim preliminary. And I don't have examples of solving huge uh, uh, problems with these methods, but I think they're interesting. So first of all, the uh, the idea of sampling with Hamiltonian dynamics uh, works by uh, uh, by first of all defining uh, your distribution of interest in the form one over z times x minus u q, like here. Uh, of course, you can do that whenever you want. Uh, and u of q is we call the potential energy, and the variable of interest we call a position, and we'll call it q. And uh, we then introduce uh, momentum variables of the same dimension as q and define a kinetic energy for them, which we call write kp. And, uh, typically, kp is just uh, some of the squares of the momentum variables divided by 2. And that corresponds then to a simple uh, Gaussian distribution for the momentum. Uh, independent of uh, our, our variable of interest q. We put those together as uh, the, what's called the Hamiltonian, a function of q and p, that's just the sum of u of q and k of p, and we define the joint density for q and p as being proportional to x to the minus h, and uh, because h splits into a sum of a function of q and a function of p, uh, q and p are independent in this joint distribution, and the marginal density uh, for Q is therefore the one of interest in the time. So you might wonder why we bothered with this, because we've just added these momentum variables, which, uh, uh, as you can see, don't really do anything in the end. Uh, uh, in the end, we're going to sample for Q and P, and then we're just going to ignore the P's we get, because we're only interested in Q. So this may seem a bit pointless, uh, but uh, it, it ought to work. Uh, and now what we do, uh, and which hopefully reveals why it's not pointless, is uh, in order to sample uh, uh, from this uh, joint distribution for Q and P in the Markov chain Monte Carlo sense, where we're going to do transitions which asymptotically will, uh, will converge to the distribution uh, that we're trying to sample from, is uh, we repeatedly do these steps. First of all, we sample P from its density, which is just a uh, uh, multivariate normal with identity covariance matrix, uh, so that's easy to do. And then we uh, find a proposal Q star P star. Uh, by simulating Hamiltonian dynamics, which I'll get to in a moment, for some amount of fictitious time. The dynamics operates according to time, but that time has nothing to do with our actual problem. It's a fictitious time that uh, lets us produce a Q star P star from a QP. And we use that Q star P star as a proposal for the Metropolis algorithm, and we accept or reject it according to the usual sort of Metropolis acceptance probability, which uh, uh, is just uh, the minimum of one and the uh, ratio of, uh, of probabilities for probability density for Q star P star and for QP, which uh, given we've expressed uh, uh, densities in this way, it turns out to be like that. Now, the, uh, at this point, you can see why it actually makes a difference that we introduce P, because Hamiltonian dynamics is going to, uh, is going to operate jointly on Q and P here. And so uh, uh, by introducing P, we get to do this proposal using, using Hamiltonian dynamics. Now. Uh, uh, why would you want to do that? Well, we'll get to that after describing what Hamiltonian dynamics actually is. Uh, so Hamiltonian dynamics, which uh, is probably familiar to lots of the audience, uh, since there seems to be a high proportion of physicists here, uh, is defined by uh, these, uh, these differential equations for how Q and P evolve in time uh, based on the partial derivatives of H with respect to uh, uh, the sort of opposite variable. So the derivative of Q with respect to time depends on the derivative of h with respect to p, uh, or for each coordinate, qi and pi. And the same for p, depending on q, except with a, with a minus sign. Uh, and now if we specialize to the actual Hamiltonian function that we're going to use here, with uh, the kinetic energy furthermore being specialized to that, then we see that this simplifies down to uh, uh, the derivative of qi with respect to time is just pi, and the derivative of pi with respect to time is just minus the uh, 
through partial derivative of potential energy with respect, to, with respect to QI. So what that means is the position variables, the Qs, get pushed around by the momentum variables like this, and the momentum variables are themselves controlled by the gradient of the potential energy, which is uh, uh, minus the gradient of potential energy, which is the same as the gradient of the law of density uh, for the distribution we want to sample from. So uh, one thing that this means is that uh, although the, the P's get changed here based on this, uh, these, these partial derivatives, uh, they don't get changed uh, typically immediately. So for, for some period of time, the Q's get pushed in the same direction, whatever the, uh, whichever direction the P's are pointing until, well, eventually the P's start pointing some other direction. But for a while, the Q's keep going in one direction. So, uh, what two pro properties that are crucial for, for Hamiltonian Monte Carlo of uh, a mapping from QP to Q star P star that we get by simulating this dynamics for some time interval are that first of all, if we simulate this dynamics exactly, H is, is uh, left unchanged. Q, H of Q star P star is equal to HQP. This is just conservation of total energy. Uh, and furthermore, the mapping preserves volume in QP space. That is, the determinant of the Jacobian matrix for this transformation is going to be 1. And uh, these will be crucial properties for uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, usefulness of correctness and usefulness of the algorithm. Now, uh, of course, we typically, except in some very trivial cases, can't actually uh, uh, solve the, uh, the, the dynamical equations exactly. We have to uh, use some finite step size and time, uh, which I'll write as epsilon and uh, proceed by, uh, by saying that, well, our original QP is going to be QP at time zero, and then we're going to go from that to Q and P at time T plus epsilon, and then Q and P at time T plus two epsilon, and so forth, up for whatever period of fictitious time we decide we're going to simulate or produce a proposal. Uh, and now you can do that in various ways, uh, but the uh, method typically used is called the leapfrog method, in which we start by doing a half step for p. We simulate up to uh, p at time t plus epsilon over 2 in the obvious way by taking the previous p and then taking epsilon over 2 times the uh, time derivative of p, which uh, just gets us that. And having simulated uh, p for a half step, we simulate q for a full step using the p at the half step point. And uh, then we finish off with uh, simulating the next half step of uh, for p, uh, taking the, the p at t plus epsilon over 2 and updating it to p uh, at t plus epsilon using the new value of q that we just found here. Uh, now I won't go into the uh, details about why this is a preferred way of, uh, uh, of, uh, of simulating uh, Hamiltonian dynamics, but uh, the crucial thing is that, well, this doesn't actually keep h constant in general, uh, so it doesn't, uh, it isn't going to, uh, whereas the exact dynamics would keep H constant, but it does preserve volume exactly uh, up to a floating point ground up here. Uh, and you can see that because actually each of these three uh, transformations from an old P to a new P or an old Q to a new Q are shear transformations in which only one of the two sets of variables, P or Q, is changed. And it's changed by an amount that only depends on the other set of variables. So these are three shear transformations that will all have Jacobian 1. Uh, so it has, it's, it's easy to see that it preserves uh, volume. Now, uh, because it's not exactly keeping h constant, however, uh, we have to uh, correct for that with a uh, accept-reject step, which is what we had here. This, uh, this would uh, always end up as 1 if we'd actually simulated the dynamics exactly, because h would have been preserved. This would be just x to 0. Uh, but since we didn't manage to simulate the dynamics exactly, in general, we may have to reject sometimes. Um, and the result of that, doing that except reject, reject decision is that the final result is exact despite the fact that the dynamical simulation here is approximate. We get exact results even with the uh, approximate simulation here, exactly in the usual Monte Carlo sense, the, the, usual, the usual Markov chain Monte Carlo sense that asymptotically will converge to the right distribution, exactly. And, uh, um, and then, of course, we collect a sample, and, well, we get the usual sample uh, variation in our estimates. Uh, but there's no uh, systematic error from, from having uh, simulated the dynamics exactly. 
Uh, now, of course, if you simulate the dynamics really exactly, it may be that your acceptance rate is extremely low, so it's not that the error in that simulation is irrelevant. So here's a demonstration, uh, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo for uh, this uh, bivariate Gaussian distribution. So Q is two-dimensional and P is two-dimensional. Uh, so to try to show what happens, I do two two-dimensional plots, one for Q here and one for P here. Um, the starting state is minus 1.5, uh, minus 1.55 here at P for P, and uh, minus 1, 1, so it must be, there's the start state, it's hiding here, I think. Ah, uh, there it is, there it is, right? Uh, for, for, for momentum. Now this is a bivariate Gaussian distribution with uh, mean zero standard deviation 1, but correlation 0.95. And so we see a one standard deviation ellipse, a dotted lines there, which hopefully you can see. And so the start point is a little bit out of the tail here, though not extremely far out of the tail. And uh, as the trajectory goes along, it, uh, it goes like this, and then it reverses direction and comes back, and well, it does uh, something sort of opposite to that at further momentum. And if we look at uh, the value of h along the trajectory, well, the initial value is 2.2. And well, the value oscillates a bit because it uh, doesn't stay constant because we're not managing to simulate the dynamics exactly. It ends up here, which uh, is 0.41 greater than the start point. So the probability of accepting the endpoint as the next state uh, will be uh, x to the minus uh, 0.41, 0.66. So we're moderately likely to accept this. Of course, it's possible, as you can see, if we happen to simulate for uh, something less than uh, 25 leapfrog steps, uh, like 16, we might have ended up with a negative error, and then we would have accepted the probability of 1. Uh, unfortunately, uh, positive errors are, are more likely than negative errors. You can prove that. <laughs> and so, uh, it's, uh, uh, although negative errors are, are, are possible, that's not, uh, you can't sort of rely on, well, half the time I'll get a negative error, except uh, that's not the way it works. So, some properties of Hamiltonian Monte Carlo are, first of all, the tra trajectory used to propose a new state proceeds systematically in one direction for quite some time. That's because Q gets pushed by P, and P is only gradually changing, so it keeps pushing Q in the same direction for a while. And uh, that's in contrast to uh, uh, something like a random walk metropolis algorithm in which you propose uh, new states uh, with, say, a Gaussian distribution centered on your current state, and uh, having proposed to move this direction and say we accept, uh, there's no particular reason we uh, won't the next time propose to move uh, right back again, or at least close to right back again, and undo the work we did for the first step. Uh, instead, for a considerable time, uh, these trajectories move in the same direction. Of course, they can't keep moving in the same direction indefinitely, or they each carry a low probability, so sooner or later they turn around. Uh, but uh, for a long time, they can keep going in the same direction. And uh, that has a big effect on the uh, uh, efficiency of things, because if we have a step size epsilon, uh, then uh, that means if you look back at how the leapfrog method is going to be working here, if we have a step size epsilon, and the p's uh, have a mean zero and standard deviation one, then typically we change q by somewhere around epsilon. So we're changing in a we're changing Q in steps of about size epsilon. And if we do L leapfrog steps, then we uh, are going to move somewhere around epsilon L distance, unless, we have to, unless we've had to double back because we've reached uh, the end of the distribution. Um, that's in contrast to if we did a random walk, in which uh, it takes sort of the square uh, to move that number of steps. So if we, wanted, if we were doing a random walk, if we randomized the momentum for every step, then to move a distance L, uh, epsilon L, we would probably have to do about L squared steps. Uh, so that's, uh, that could be a big uh, difference if the suitable value for L is something like 1,000. Right? Um, now we have to tune the step size epsilon to be small enough for the dynamics to be stable. So typically uh, with the leapfrog method, uh, there'll be some crucial value for epsilon beyond which the error in H grows exponentially. If you, you can't put up with that. You have to keep it at least that small enough to avoid that, and, uh, but, and perhaps a bit smaller if you want the error in H to be small enough that you actually have a, a reasonable chance of, it, uh, of accepting. 
uh, having two adepsilins, then, then we need to tune the number of leapfrog steps so that we uh, uh, move uh, far enough to get to a nearly independent point. So here, uh, you could say that L equals 25, which is what I did here, was maybe a little bit too big because we not only moved to a distant point, we started moving back to where we came from. So maybe that was a little bit too large a value of L. Uh, but L equals uh, 4 wouldn't have been large enough because it wouldn't have taken us anywhere near the whole distance that we could go. Uh, and so we would end up uh, then doing a random walk with small trajectories and it would be much less efficient. Um, now, you might think that as we make L bigger, that our acceptance probability would go down. But in many cases, that's not the case. Uh, here, for instance, we see that uh, the error in H just oscillates here. Uh, and it isn't systematically getting any bigger as we uh, go to larger number of leapfrog steps. Now, uh, for a very small number of leapfrog steps, that's not necessarily true. It could be that for only one or two leapfrog steps, you have substantially less error than if you did 100. But uh, the typical behavior is doing 100 or 200 uh, doesn't uh, systematically uh, uh, change things. Although uh, there's some complications there that if you, uh, you really want to make sure that you're not somehow accidentally hitting one of the worst points here, you might want to randomize either the step size or the number of leapfrog steps a little bit. So now, uh, in figuring out how, how methods work, it's, it's useful to ask what they're invariant to. And so HMC is invariant to translation and rotation of the coordinate system for Q, uh, assuming we uh, keep the kinetic energy for P fixed at uh, the sum of uh, Pi squared over 2. Uh, if we did some arbitrary in, uh, invertible linear transformation for Q, so we change U so it incorporated that transformation, then uh, we would also be able to get uh, to exactly the same effective behavior if we did the inverse transformation for P. Uh, but uh, if we uh, stick to translations and locations, uh, then we just keep P fixed. That's because our, uh, our normal distribution for P with mean zero and identity covariance is spherically symmetrical, so rotating it wouldn't make any difference anyway. So that means, uh, for instance, that here I, I could have equally well tested this uh, on a, uh, on a uh, bivariate Gaussian distribution with no correlation but with one variance bigger than the other. And that, uh, because you just rotate this 45 degrees, that's what you get. So uh, for, uh, for HMC, uh, the, the rotation of the coordinate system doesn't make any difference. And uh, well, that might, you might see that as good or you might see that as bad if you thought there was something particularly nice about your, your particular coordinate system, then HMC isn't exploiting that. Now, uh, uh, finally, some scaling characteristics of Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. Uh, as we increase the dimensionality uh, in a certain way by basically just adding independent replicas for original variables, which, uh, um, of course, is not what we really normally do, uh, but uh, maybe is a sort of approximate model of some high dimensional problems, then the optimal step size, epsilon, decreases as d to the minus 1 quarter. The optimal number of leapfrog steps increases as d to one quarter because we want to maintain the same length of trajectory in fictitious time. And the uh, number of leapfrog steps needed to reach a nearly independent point then grows as d to a quarter uh, with the number of leapfrog, uh, with the, uh, because we want to uh, uh, keep that trajectory the same, the same length in fictitious time. So if we compare this with random walk metropolis updates, uh, for them it turns out that the optimal proposal standard deviation decreases as d to the minus a half. Um, and then the number of updates needed to reach a nearly independent point grows in proportion to d. Uh, you might think it could grow in proportion to d to, d to the one half, uh, since the step size is going down, it's d to the mi minus the half. But remember that random walk Metropolis is doing a random walk, and it to go a particular distance in terms of number of steps, it typically <coughs> requires the square of that distance, uh, number of steps equal to the square of how far you want to go to actually be likely to have gone that far. And so we see that uh, we have a big difference here between uh, uh, the computational effort growing at, in proportion to dimensionality versus uh, in proportion to dimensionality of the one quarter. So that's uh, one of the reasons why HMC can be much better than random walk metropolis. The other being uh, that even in small dimensions, if you have high correlation like this, 
uh, then uh, HMC can avoid doing a random walk, whereas random walk Metropolis will will, uh, will do a random walk. And the uh, uh, advantage of HMC is then over random walk Metropolis is then proportional to basically the ratio of the narrow direction to the, walk, the long direction. And for some distributions, that could be quite large, like hundreds of thousands. And that's even, so that's an advantage even in low dimensions. But if, furthermore, you have a high dimensional problem. Uh, the scaling, the, the fair, more favorable scaling properties of HMC come into, into play as well. So I think that's uh, the end of my uh, uh, review of, uh, of hybrid Monte Carlo, uh, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, uh, whichever you want to call it. Uh, any uh, questions on that before I get to the new stuff? Is there any opportunity to improve your solution for the Hamiltonian? We used a, a fairly simple scheme for solving your couple of first order equations. Is there some better scheme you can use up there? Ah, well, that's uh, been uh, uh, there's been a fair amount of research on that. And while there are schemes that are, are accurate to higher order asymptotically, and if you were tackling a sufficiently high dimensional problem, those presumably are beneficial. But um, the general experience has been that it's pretty hard to uh, beat leapfrog method in practice, uh, even though uh, I mean, it ought to be possible asymptotically as the dimensionality goes up. But um, problems where it's actually beneficial seem to be hard to find. Yep. If I took your computed Hamiltonian and put it into an evolution operator, like e to the minus i h t over h bar, would you preserve unitarity with this scheme? Uh, this is all classical here. Oh, okay. uh, there's no quantum mechanics going on here. Uh, OK, so uh, that's, uh, that's the existing uh, Hamiltonian Monte Carlo method from 1987. What I'll be talking about now is my new billiard Monte Carlo scheme, which I'll start off by describing how you do Hamiltonian Monte Carlo when you have some uh, uh, some hard constraints about, uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, just consider simple constraints that one of the Q's has to be greater than or, or equal to some lower bound or less than or equal to some upper bound, or you can do that for more than one of the Q's. And uh, we can ask, how do we modify Hamiltonian dynamics to handle this? Now, this is of in interest in itself. Um, I believe the next talk we'll be talking about uh, 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 why you might actually be interested in this. Uh, but here I'm doing it mainly uh, to uh, uh, introduce uh, uh, the, the, the method I'm going to describe. And well, we can do that. We just imagine that u of q increases very rapidly over a short range as qi starts to violate this, the constraint. Um, it doesn't particularly matter how it increases rapidly as long as it smoothly increases very rapidly there. And then there'll be a large value of, uh, of the partial derivative of u with respect to that q, at, um, which will reduce p sub i until it reaches 0, and then it'll change sign and start moving away from the uh, region that's uh, not allowed, at which point uh, qi will uh, also start moving away from the boundary, because pi has now changed sign, it'll move away from the boundary, and it'll start increasing, pi will, will uh, increase uh, until it ends up having the same magnitude as before, but with the opposite sign. It just basically bounces off the boundary with the uh, uh, component of momentum normal to the boundary getting negated. And uh, so it goes in there and bounces off. If uh, there were some other dimensions as well, it'll, those will continue on unaffected by this bounce. And so another way of looking at it is it, it bounces uh, with the angle of reflection being the same as the angle of incidence, if you want to uh, think of it that way. Uh, and so uh, this is uh, this one can uh, just uh, that's that's sort of describe what describes what the real dynamics is. Uh, but uh, you can implement it in, in terms of leapfrog steps by uh, just replacing the update for Q with one of those. So here the update for P uh, it, Q isn't changing, so we don't have to worry about hitting a boundary there. Same for this. It's uh, here where it could be that Q I T plus epsilon violates the constraint, and so. Uh, at this point, we're sort of just moving uh, with a constant velocity given by p sub i, and we just have to uh, bounce that, that uh, motion with constant velocity off the uh, constraint surface. So uh, in a, one special case is where u of q is constant within the allowed region, and then it's infinite uh, where the constraints are violated. 
And in that case, uh, what, the only thing that's happening is this bouncing off walls. Uh, for all the allowed values of q, the partial derivative of u with respect to q is, is just zero. And so the only uh, way the momentum changes is as a result of these bounces. And uh, that particular special case is, uh, is sometimes called billiards. And so there's, uh, I think there's probably lots of papers about billiards. Uh, <laughs> uh, but it's, you can think of it as uh, this special case of Hamiltonian dynamics when we have uh, uh, a u of q that's, uh, that's constant everywhere except where it goes to infinity. So uh, that's all. That's all interesting. If you happen to actually have a distribution that's uh, uh, that's uh, uh, uniform over some region, which would give you that potential energy. Uh, but uh, suppose that we don't have that sort of dis uh, distribution of interest. Um, uh, so it might seem that that billiards idea isn't actually relevant. But uh, the thing, thing one can realize here is that when using Hamiltonian dynamics for sampling, as opposed to trying to actually simulate some real physical system. Uh, we're free to choose the kinetic energy however we wish. So I've so far assumed the kinetic energy is just the sum of the squares of momentum divided by two, but we can use any kinetic energy that we like. And in particular, we can choose a kinetic energy that's constant within some region, uh, and then infinity uh, outside the region. And that produces sort of a reverse billiards, in which it's uh, P that bounces off the walls rather than Q bounces off the walls, rather than negating P, instead what happens is we flip Q to a point, uh, uh, an opposite point of equal potential energy. Uh, when we negate P, we're also we're flipping P to an opposite point of equal kinetic energy, and we have to do the analogous thing uh, when we do reverse billiards and we flip Q to an opposite point of equal potential energy. So here's how this works in one dimension. How much time I have here? Uh, so suppose Q is one dimensional with uh, some density given by a, a potential energy function U. And uh, so since Q is one dimensional, P is also one dimensional. And we let its kinetic energy be zero for P within this interval minus one plus one and infinity elsewhere, giving a uniform distribution over minus one plus one. Now it wouldn't really matter if we chose any other uniform distribution over some integral, we would get. Uh, effectively the same results, so this doesn't, this isn't really restricting the generality for this one-dimensional example. So we can uh, do a contour plot of the Hamiltonian, uh, uh, u of q plus k of p, and that's what I've done here. q is on the horizontal axis, p is on the vertical axis. Uh, h is infinity when p is greater than plus one or less than minus one, so these two horizontal lines are the infinity numbers. <coughs> and then, uh, in between here, uh, k, is, uh, k of p is zero in here, so the uh, Hamiltonian is just determined by u, and I just uh, put down some arbitrary contours here for some, some uh, random choice of u. Uh, we have contours with u being 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, corresponding to some, some potential energy that dips in the middle, and some density of interest for q that is, has a hump here, where it goes has scales that go down. And now uh, suppose that our initial state is here with q equal to 1.5 and p somewhere around 0.7. Uh, and we now ask what, what's, what is the Hamiltonian dynamics going to do here? Well, uh, uh, one thing we can look at is Hamiltonian dynamics keeps the Hamiltonian uh, uh, constant, of course. So it should uh, be a uh, on a, on a, it should be sticking on a particular contour for the Hamiltonian. So here we, uh, we're, uh, we're starting at a Hamiltonian value of five, so it should be staying on this contour and this contour. And well, we imagine that the Hamiltonian goes from zero, uh, the kinetic energy goes from zero to infinity uh, in some rapid way right at this infinity contour, so it goes along the value of five there that's just slightly short of infinity there. Uh, so it goes on, like, on, on those contours. <coughs> now uh, we have to ask what's the dynamics going to actually be like here. So uh, here are the dynamical equations. And uh, when we ask what's the derivative, uh, time derivative of q with respect to time, uh, well, it's equal to the partial derivative of h with respect to p. Uh, 
Well, that's equal to the partial derivative of the kinetic energy with respect to P. And the kinetic energy is constant until we hit uh, plus or minus 1 for P. So Q doesn't, uh, for most of the time, Q just stays put, right? Because this is 0 unless we, until, except when we hit the, the wall for, for, for P. Uh, the derivative of P with respect to time is given by minus the derivative of the potential energy with respect to Q, which uh, typically isn't 0. So uh, what we see here is uh, uh, at this point here, the derivative of u with respect to uh, q is negative because, as you see, these contours are getting smaller as we go to the right. Uh, so minus u minus the derivative is positive, and so p increases. Q doesn't change. Uh, so we start here and we go up until we hit the plus 1, where uh, suddenly the derivative of k with respect to p is very, very large. Right. And so suddenly the time derivative of q becomes huge, um, infinite in fact, and we zip right over here in zero time, uh, and uh, at which point we, we come to a place where uh, uh, the derivative of u with respect to q is uh, um, positive now, so minus that is negative, so p starts decreasing while q stays fixed. Until we come down here, where we again get an infinite derivative of k with respect to p, and we zip in zero time over here, and then we start going up there. Uh, for however long we've decided to simulate this uh, dynamics, which uh, I assume stops once we get there. Of course, if we uh, continued on longer, we'd just go around and around and around for some number of times, sticking on that uh, contour for, for h. So, uh, does that make sense? Okay, so uh, one thing, uh, uh, okay, so let's uh, see and then how, how in more, more detail how we simulate trajectories. Uh, so uh, we want to compute a tra trajectory of duration d starting at, uh, at q naught p naught. We set time to zero, we set p to p naught, q to q naught. And then we uh, uh, compute a velocity, uh, which is uh, minus the uh, partial derivative of, of u with respect to q, well, except we're assuming q is one dimensional, so uh, uh, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a regular derivative. And uh, having found that velocity with which uh, q, with, with which p is going to move, uh, the terminology here may seem a bit backwards. It's uh, usually you think of velocities for, key, for, for q, but here we reversed things, so, so v is the velocity for p. And so we uh, find how long it's going to take for p to reach one of the boundaries, plus or minus 1, and we'll call that time delta. Um, and then if uh, t plus delta is less than the duration we wanted to simulate for, then we just uh, update p by that amount and we're done. Otherwise, uh, uh, um, p is going to actually reach this boundary within the time we want to simulate for. We set our time to uh, be delta larger, we set p to be p plus delta v, at which point t will be either plus or minus 1, since we chose delta to be the time needed to reach one of those boundaries. And then we solve the equation u q star equals u q for some q star other than q, and uh, set our u q to uh, that q star. So this uh, is going to accomplish the flip to sort of the other side, so that's what happens here. We solve uh, for the uh, value of q other than 1.5, which is where we are now, for which we have a value of potential energy the same as we have here. And that gets us over there. Um, and then we return to step two, figure out what the derivative of u is with respect to q at our new point. So uh, the crucial step here computationally is, is uh, solving the equation here in step four. And if we, if we solve that equation exactly, then uh, we'll be simulating the dynamics exactly. Um, and it's typically feasible to, to solve this equation exactly up to machine precision uh, using some uh, superlinearly convergent method like newton raphson iteration, which uh, is going to take only uh, favorable cases at least, uh, like uh, half a dozen iterations or something to. Uh, to uh, find the solution to machine precision. So, uh, you, uh, and uh, we're assuming we're not uh, 
trying to be any more accurate than machine precision here. So uh, uh, we then don't need an accept-reject test because we've simulated the dynamics exactly. Uh, so uh, this, is, uh, this is a bit surprising uh, in a way because uh, um, there's, a, there's a theorem saying that uh, any uh, simulation of Hamiltonian dynamics that preserves space, space volume, and preserves the Hamiltonian has to be simulating it exactly. So you might have, you might have hoped for, for Hamiltonian Monte Carlo that you could not only preserve the phase space volume, which you need to do, but also preserve H, and then you wouldn't have to do any rejections. Uh, but there's a theorem saying that the only way to do that is to simulate the dynamics, simulate the trajectories exactly. There's no way, no inexact simulation that would uh, make those two things exact without, without making the whole trajectory exact. And then you might say, well, uh, that's hopeless in all but the simplest cases. Uh, but you can see here that it's uh, not hopeless in this context where we got to cho choose the kinetic energy. Uh, and it's the essential point is we chose the kinetic energy to be piecewise constant. And that uh, opens the possibility <coughs> of, of doing the dynamics by solving equations like this. And if we uh, solve those equations essentially uh, exactly, then we will have simulated the dynamics exactly. Okay, so that's uh, just in one dimension. Uh, that's not too interesting, of course. Uh, when the dimension is, uh, is, is more than one, then uh, there's many possible choices for a region in which uh, k of p is, uh, is zero, uh, with it being infinity elsewhere. One natural choice is a hypersphere of radius one centered at p equals zero. Um, and so with this uh, choice, a uh, trajectory of duration d gets simulated like this, where we have to now look at the gradient of, of u rather than uh, uh, just a single derivative. And we have to find the time until p intersects the surface of the hypersphere. And uh, once again, either <laughs> say, well, uh, we're done, or we, uh, we go to that hypersphere boundary and then do a bounce off that by solving an equation like this. In this case, we have to solve it's still a uh, one-dimensional equation we have to solve uh, uh, for some scalar x value that uh, makes this true other than x equal to zero. And then we can update our q in that way and go back in sort of the uh, obvious, uh, more or less obvious generalization of the one-dimensional uh, step. Um, so here's an example of that with the bivariate Gaussian. So uh, I didn't draw the contour of the bivariate Gaussian here. It would be something like this. Uh, so this is Q1 and Q2. Uh, this is P1 and P2. And here is uh, the hypersphere, which in two dimensions is a circle. And uh, we start out at the dot here and the dot there. And uh, initially, uh, since uh, P starts out not at the boundary, the derivative of uh, H with respect to uh, P is zero. And so initially, Q just sticks right there, while uh, P changes until it hits the uh, until it hits the boundary, at which point uh, uh, Q abruptly changes, and then uh, uh, Q stays put for a while while P changes until it hits the boundary again, and so forth. Uh, this is a time plot in fictitious time of uh, what Q1 and Q2 are in uh, red and green, and what P1 and P2 are in red and green. And so you can see here that Q1 and Q2 are, stay constant until they abruptly change at the points where uh, uh, where, where P has hit the uh, boundary of the hypersphere. Um, and now you can see that we have the effect here of suppressing random walks that we would be hoping for, uh, uh, in which uh, Q changes uh, systematically in one direction until, well, eventually has to turn around. Uh, and so it, it turns around for a little bit here uh, before we hit the, uh, the pre-specified amount of fictitious time. So that picture makes sense? Okay, now uh, one thing you may worry about here is we haven't, uh, we, this is certainly not an orthotic method because uh, uh, as we flip around from one uh, uh, point for Q to another, uh, by solving this equation, we're obviously keeping U constant. So uh, Q is staying on one contour of the potential energy, uh, which is the same as staying uh, at a fixed value for the law of density for Q. So now, obviously, we have to move between uh, such contours if we want to properly sample the distribution. Uh, so this, this is actually a general problem with various different Markov chain Monte Carlo methods, which are capable of moving around while staying on one contour uh, or staying on approximately one contour. 
uh, but aren't very good at moving between different contours. And you, uh, uh, one solution to that is you alternate them with some other method that can move between contours. And now what's the best method for that is uh, an interesting research question. Um, uh, one can certainly do something simple, like just doing a simple random walk, random walk metropolis update. Uh, that's not necessarily the best thing to do, but um, I'm sort of taking uh, what's the best thing to do as a separate problem here because it's not, not actually unique to uh, Billiard Monte Carlo uh, wanting to solve that problem. So uh, then the hope would be that the Billiard Monte Carlo updates will be able to quickly move to distant points while these other updates take care of moving between different values for the density. Uh, and sometimes those are sort of separate problems. If we have particularly low dimensions, moving to different values with the density isn't really very hard. Uh, but if there's very high correlations, even in low dimensions, moving uh, a long distance along uh, a cigar shape, say, could be difficult. And so uh, the billion Monte Carlo could, up, could take care of that, uh, while the uh, simple random walk metropolis updates take care of the simpler problem of moving between contours. It's a simpler problem if you're in low dimensions. Um, another uh, uh, issue here is that it's uh, a bit difficult to guess how long we want our trajectories to be in fictitious time. And uh, I think I should accelerate here. So I'll just say there's a solution to that in which you fix your tra trajectories by number of bounces, which is the amount of computation time you're going to have to spend. Uh, one can uh, manage to do that. And uh, in the end, what you get for some properties of hypersphere uh, billion Monte Carlo is first of all, it's invariant to translation and rotation of the coordinates for Q, uh, because uh, uh, basically, uh, because hyperspheres are rotationally invariant. Um, if the trajectory length is determined by the number of bounces, it's also invariant to equal scaling of all the coordinates, which is not at all true for uh, uh, ordinary Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, uh, where you would, if you rescaled all the coordinates, you'd have to choose a new step size epsilon for the leapfrog step. Um, but for Billiard Monte Carlo, there's no such step, parameter, step size parameter that has to be tuned. Um, basically because uh, if, you, uh, if you just change the size of your hypersphere, it just takes longer to reach the, the edges. And as long as you're, uh, as you're choosing your trajectory length in terms of number of bounces, that doesn't make any difference. Uh, so that's an uh, uh, interesting advantage over regular HMC because there's the tuning the step size parameter for HMC can sometimes be a bit of a problem. Um, so now you do still have to time uh, the trajectory length, uh, tune the trajectory length uh, or number of bounces so that uh, you do an appropriate number of bounces to lead you to a distant point without uh, going round and round and round the whole distribution several times. Um, now, uh, if you figure out, at least in some simple cases that I've looked at, uh, what the scaling is with dimensionality, the number of bounces needed to reach a distant point seems to scale as e to the one half, which is uh, not as favorable as HMC, but is more favorable uh, than uh, simple random walk uh, metropolis. Um, so I phrase this as number of bounces needed to reach a distant point, not an independent point, because of course it's not an independent point because it stays on the same density contour. Uh, so unfortunately, if you need to move between density contours and you're doing it with a random walk update like Metropolis, then the uh, number of these Metropolis updates needed to move to a nearly independent uh, density contour is going to scale as d. Uh, so uh, that's unfortunate because without that, we would get d to the 1 half. Uh, so we need a better way of changing the potential energy uh, to take full advantage of, of this. Uh, this, of course, is not as good as HMC, but there are other advantages here, like there being no step size parameter to tune. So uh, that uh, would be uh, a reason why one might uh, prefer BMC, even though it doesn't have as good uh, scaling properties as, uh, as HMC. Now, there's another, op there's another option, or well, many options, but one other option for, uh, for the momentum in BMC is to make it uniform not over a hypersphere, but over a hypercube. Uh, with this, choice, the bounce changes only one coordinate of Q, because uh, the, uh, the uh, derivative of, of the kinetic energy, the gradient, is always just pointing along a coordinate axis. And it's uh, often the case for many problems that when you change just one coordinate, you can quickly recompute the potential energy and its gradient. 
uh, much faster than if you had to compute it for a completely unrelated queue, assuming, of course, that you saved suitable intermediate results from the previous computation. And so that's uh, uh, a reason why this might be advantageous. Uh, it sort of resembles over-relaxation methods uh, uh, for Gaussian distributions in this respect, but it's applicable to any distribution. Um, unfortunately, like over-relaxation, it seems rather difficult to analyze exactly how well it works. However, uh, empirically, it doesn't seem to work as, as well as the hypersphere version, at least if you don't count this computational savings from incremental computation. So here is a quick picture of that, which I think I'll skip because I want to at least uh, briefly talk about the next topic uh, before my time is up. Uh, right. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so Hamiltonian report sampling is, uh, is another application of Hamiltonian dynamics uh, in, a, in a new sort of way to Monte Carlo methods. Uh, first of all, to review what I'm calling important sampling, the term gets used differently at times. Uh, the idea of important sampling is uh, we're interested in this distribution pi of x that's proportional uh, to f of x, uh, but we can't sample from that distribution. But we can sample from this distribution with density proportional to g of x, and uh, we decide we'll sample a bunch of points drawn according to g, and then estimate an expectation with respect to pi as a weighted average, where the weighting factors w are given by the ratios of the, of the density uh, uh, of f of x over g of x uh, for, for each of the points we sampled from g. You can then, uh, that, that's how you can estimate expectations, and you can also estimate the ratio of normalizing constants as just the, uh, the average of the weights. Now, this is an old method uh, that uh, people have tried using for all sorts of pro problems. Um, the difficulties with it is when pi is complex and high dimensional, it's often difficult to get a distribution g that uh, is going to work. And for one to work, it has to first of all be a good approximation to pi. In particular, uh, uh, it needs uh, to not give very low probability to regions of pi that uh, have significant probability, uh, since it would be sort of impossible to get a good estimate of anything in that case. Um, we have to be able to feasibly sample from it, preferably independently. Otherwise, of course, we can't do anything. Uh, and now, uh, unfortunately, easily sampled distributions like Gaussians are usually not good approximations. Uh, a, a good approximation might be constructed by something like doing k metropolis updates from a start state drawn from some broad distribution. You may think that would give you a pretty good approximation. Um, but uh, as well as being able to sample according to g, we also have to be able to compute g of x, because we need that for the importance weights. And unfortunately, distributions like uh, those defined by K-Metropolis updates would, in, would make it very difficult to calculate G of X because it would be an integral, integral over all the intermediate states. And uh, that would be, uh, as far as I can tell, completely hopeless. So uh, the idea here is going to be to try to bypass those difficulties and get uh, uh, a complex uh, important sampling distribution that's adapted to our actual distribution that we're trying to uh, trying to uh, deal with, and but it, that is still feasible to sample from and to compute the density according to. And so, uh, as a preliminary, just a reminder of how probability densities uh, transform. Uh, if we have a, have a density for x, uh, and we have a transformation of y in some uh, invertible transformation of x, then the density for y is obtained from the from the density uh, uh, at the h inverse of y according to x divided by this, uh, this uh, absolute value determinant. In particular, if y is a of x uh, for uh, some uh, vectors y and x, then uh, the density for y is the density for uh, uh, under x of y over alpha uh, divided by alpha to, to the d. So if we just rescale things, we can easily compute the uh, new density. So here's the uh, basic Hamiltonian important sampling algorithm. Uh, which uh, uh, doesn't actually solve this problem, but sort of looks like it might. So let's uh, suppose that uh, we extend our state space to uh, uh, the uh, uh, Q and P uh, position of momentum, and we make the, the uh, density for, for that joint state of Q and P be proportional to X with minus the Hamiltonian divided by some 
possible temperature parameter, which will set to one for the distribution we're actually interested in, and we'll make the usual choice for the kinetic energy there. We can define an important sampling distribution for Q and P as follows. We generate Q from some simple broad distribution, uh, which we can sample from and where we, which we can compute the density for. And we uh, uh, generate P from a from uh, the distribution defined like this, uh, but at some high temperature T naught, not T <coughs> one. So it's uh, uh, it, P has a higher variance than uh, it does in the real distribution pi of x. Then we then apply K leapfrog steps to move from an initial from this initial QP to a final QP. And note that the Jacobian for each leapfrog step is one. So the the density. Uh, uh, at the final QP is just the same as the density at the initial QP. Uh, so that's not quite what we do, because after each light leapfrog step, we multiply P by some factor alpha less than one. Um, now this is going to cool the system toward the desired temperature of T equals one. Uh, that may be uh, obvious to some people. Uh, uh, to others, the, the initial high temperature we, we chose, which we sampled uh, larger values for the, for the momentum than are typical of the real distribution we're interested in, produced large values of the momentum which move the uh, position variables around a lot because we have large values. And so we're not getting the right distribution at that point for Q because it's moved, things are moved around too much by P. But we're going to now be making P smaller and smaller, and so that effect is going to go away. Um, now the Jacobian for this uh, uh, is for this multiplication is just alpha to the d, which is easy to compute, right? So we can uh, uh, we can easily compute we can easily do this procedure, and when we get to a final point after some number of leapfrog steps, we can easily compute the probability density for having gotten that point, even though the final distribution here is extremely complex. If we assume that u was something complex, then these leapfrog steps are doing complex nonlinear things, and the, the distribution we get uh, at the end is something extremely complex, but we can still compute the density for the point we got, because, uh, because all these Jacobians along the way were just simple to compute. And, and therefore, we can use the, uh, the, uh, this, this procedure defines an important sampling density uh, that both is going to be adapted to the actual distribution because of all this Hamiltonian dynamics involving the actual u, and has a density that uh, we can actually compute, so we can compute the importance weights. Uh, so here's the details, which I think I'll skip. Uh, there is uh, one thing to note is there is quite a bit of tuning involved, which is sort of significant in the edge. And here's some properties here. Uh, we, can, we can get uh, ex estimate of estimates of expectations and estimates for the normalizing constants. Um, it's exact, apart from round off and, stati and the usual Monte Carlo statistical errors. There's no error in theory from the finite leapfrog step size, although uh, as for HMC, if you really have too big a step size, it's not going to work in practice. Uh, because it's sort of an annealing style method that's gradually cooling things, it'll tend to visit all the different local modes as you do different, uh, as you get different points here with different runs, it'll uh, tend to get into different modes, and it'll, it'll know how to weight them correctly. Um, and uh, we can compute these weights, uh, even though the distribution is very complex. And uh, because it cools the system by extracting energy a bit at a time, it passes through all the intermediate energy uh, states, which I think uh, John will tell you is a good property. Uh, um, and it also is a good property because it, uh, it does mean you don't have to come up with detailed scheduled temperatures to go through. So now, what would we expect this to work? Well, for important sampling to work well, all points of pi of x have to have a reasonably high probability of being sampled. This is the most crucial property. Furthermore, points not typical of pi of x shouldn't be sampled too often. Uh, but it would be okay if half the time we got a point that wasn't typical of pi of x. That just means we're wasting half our effort, but that's not that would be fatal. Uh, now, to check how well handled Plutonian important sampling works, we can imagine backwards to trajectory with sort of the opposite operation, starting from points drawn according to pi, and then ask whether those backward trajectories are going to uh, lead you to points that are typical of the initial distribution uh, that we use to start the process off. 
And well, there's reason to doubt that. First of all, we need to make a pretty good guess at the number of leapfrog steps to do uh, in order to get the system to cool down to t equals 1 after that. Uh, you could say you do a few trial runs and, and pick k that way, but maybe you need to do different numbers of steps for, di for different modes that you end up with. So, it's a, uh, so that's a, a reason why we might expect that the simple algorithm I just described isn't actually going to work very well. <coughs> so here's a picture of the problem. Uh, here's our kinetic energy. Here's our position coordinates. And there's supposed to be some black dots that are a bit hard to see in that gray area, which represent typical points from, from uh, two high probability regions for the actual distribution of interest. And now we imagine doing backwards trajectories while, uh, while dividing by alpha to raise the temperature and uh, see where we get after doing that with k leapfrog steps. And uh, for this to work properly, we have to, all the backwards trajectories have to end up in the high probability region for our initial sampling distribution. And well, there's no particular reason why that's necessarily going to happen. And so uh, we might not expect that to work. But we can solve that by pick picking the number of steps we, we do randomly. And uh, without going over the details, we can then see that well, if we randomly pick how long they are, so we say we, we choose a, a point, uh, we choose k uh, randomly over some range, in this case a range of three possibilities, I assume, now we look at the backward trajectories. It could be we, we get three possible starting points along each backward trajectory. And now it's quite possible that uh, each backward trajectory has at least one of those three in the high probability region for the initial sampling. So that, uh, that uh, uh, can, uh, can address that problem. Another problem uh, that maybe is more of a problem in physics applications than statistics ap applications is ensuring uh, equipartition of the kinetic energy. We have to make sure that at, when, on these backward trajectories, we end up with a typical distribution of kinetic energy rather than all the kinetic energy being in one coordinate and not in the other coordinates, for instance. And you can do that by just randomly mixing things up a bit. And then uh, uh, finally, uh, this seems a little bit uh, inefficient, randomly choosing a, a K and then doing a trajectory like that and having to uh, uh, sort of do all, do all possible random choices there. We can actually uh, we have to sort of simulate backwards to see what all, to get the total probability for getting someplace from all the random trajectory lengths. And that, having done that, we can actually get uh, things for, for, for all the different uh, lengths of trajectories, not just one of them picked at random. Um, now another problem is that uh, uh, these high values for the momentum are going to uh, uh, sort of make it so that we move around in Q space more than uh, we would in the distribution of interest, which is sometimes what we want in its entirety. But for a Bayesian model, probably we don't want to start ignoring the prior. We only want to start ignoring the likelihood. And so we want the, uh, the high temperature embodied in large values of the momentum to wash out the likelihood effect, but not wash out the prior effect. Well, there's a, a trick to doing that in which we, uh, uh, in which we apply things related to slice sampling just to the prior. And so uh, we, we effectively uh, do the prior by uh, absolute constraints that are continually varying to get the, uh, uh, the prior, which I'm assuming is not just uniform over some region. Uh, and those absolute constraints aren't affected by how big the momentum is. Uh, so the momentum only has the effect of, of uh, downweighting the likelihood rather than the prior. Well, uh, after all this work, uh, it still has some problems, I have to report. Uh, as for other annealing methods, it's hard to decide what temperature to start at and uh, uh, how fast to cool. And as for other important sampling methods, it's hard to tell how well it's working. Uh, uh, the problem with important sampling methods is that it's possible for the variance of the important rates, importance weights to be extremely high without you actually knowing this. Uh, uh, that's a general important sampling problem. And uh, more particularly to this, uh, it seems to be rather hard to tune. Uh, there's a lot of things you have to tune, and uh, it can be a bit different, difficult to figure out whether you've tuned them correctly and such. Uh, so, uh, well, I'm still playing around with it. Uh, another thing I'm playing around with is whether you can apply this idea to other MCMC methods. So it's, it's very natural to do this in the Hamiltonian context because you have these momentum variables around, which already provide a heat reservoir. 
Uh, you can start them off with really big values with high kinetic energy, and then you can extract energy by just the simple operation of multiplying them by something less than one. And uh, that extraction of energy from those momentum variables has the effect of cooling down the distribution on the other variables. Um, but we might wonder whether we could do something similar with a method such as Metropolis. We can uh, introduce another variable that's a heat reservoir, that's uh, say just a positive real, uh, we initialize to a large value, it has an energy equal to its value. Um, and then we do Metropolis proposals with acceptance and rejection based on seeing whether we can transfer enough energy from that heat reservoir to do the uh, move or not. And we can cool the system by just multiplying H by factor alpha and so forth, which all seems very analogous. Uh, the unfortunate thing though is that even if you sort of take the random proposal offsets to be given, the mapping here is not invertible because you can, uh, uh, you can just imagine that you get to a point either by rejecting a move or by accepting a move. So uh, I'm not sure here whether there's some way of fixing that, uh, and, and, but it also does seem that you might be able to try to apply this idea to other uh, MCMC methods like slice sampling, where uh, from preliminary thoughts it may be easier to avoid this invertibility, uh, lack of invertibility problem. So, that's it. Thank you very much. Are there questions? Are there different classes of problems that these different Monte Carlo strategies are better suited for? Uh, well, certainly there are different issues here. What I didn't mention here is, of course, to do uh, uh, any of these methods, you have to be able to compute the gradient of potential energy. And so uh, sometimes that's a problem. Uh, you have to uh, either manually or automatically uh, produce code <coughs> to compute derivatives. So uh, if, you, if that's hard, then, uh, then uh, HMC isn't for you, I would say. Uh, there, is, there, there can also be particular characteristics of distributions that affect things. So HMC uh, may not work very well for distributions where you would basically need to use drastically different step sizes in different parts of the space. Um, at least it, it might not work well without further elaborations to do something about that. Because then if you, you'd have to choose the smallest step size that's, that's needed, but then that would be very inefficient in the other uh, regions. Now there are possible solutions to that, but those are, there certainly are issues as to, uh, uh, to do with what distribution you're, you're dealing with that would affect which method would be best. Uh, uh, it's hard to say that, uh, oh, my marvelous CMC method is the best method for all distributions. Uh, that's probably too much to hope for. So um, I don't have a uh, question. Uh, I just have my desire. Uh, uh, <laughs> so you mentioned in the third part that uh, this method still involves some fine tuning. I really wish that you can uh, have two uh, very simplified Two examples from one extreme case to the others, and how you fine tune it. Um, so I'm not quite. Usually, uh, the simplified examples are not the ones that are difficult to tune. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's the complicated examples that are hard to tune. So I'm not quite clear. Like if you uh, if you look at uh, uh, the simple bivariate Gaussian example. Uh, for HMC, say, uh, here we have it. Well, uh, uh, I chose epsilon equal to 0.25, and that's related to the standard deviation in the uh, most constrained direction here. And so, well, in this simple example, uh, well, you can change that, and you can say, well, then epsilon has to change. Uh, that's, uh, but it, you know, bivariate Gaussian is relatively easy to figure out what's going on. Uh, either from theoretical considerations or just from trial runs. Uh, the, the problem would be like, suppose there's two modes which have different uh, standard deviations in the most constrained direction. And you could uh, start out in one mode and you, you tune your epsilon that seems nice for that mode, uh, being ignorant of the fact it's not so nice for the other mode. And the worst part of that is if there's this other mode, which we'll, we'll assume is somewhat connected to the first one, otherwise you have a different problem. Uh, uh, so if you chose it, and it has a narrower standard deviation. So you really need a, a step size that's, comp that's uh, based on that narrower standard deviation. 
If it, you instead happen to start here and you do your trial run starting from here, you choose an epsilon based on that one, which is fine for that mode, but would produce an extremely high rejection rate in the other mode. And now, uh, uh, that wouldn't be so bad if you then saw the extremely high rejection rate, but because the rejection rate there is extremely high, if you ever got there, you'd stay there for a trillion iterations. And since the method asymptotically produces the right answer, that means it's extremely unlikely that you'll move from the place you started to that one. And so you may never see that mode and never see that your step size is too big. So that's the uh, sort of absolute worst case of being hard to tune. It's uh, 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 you do your trial runs, you think you've tuned it well, but actually you've tuned it horribly and you're getting completely the wrong answer. Uh, these are sort of the, uh, the nightmare scenarios of uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo. <laughs> Okay, I'm sorry to suppress the further questions, but we are in an extremely tight schedule. So let's thank the speaker again.